Please note that this video contains spoilers. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, movie thoughts. I really like the way the corrupting influence of the ring is dealt with in the film. I feel that it does a fantastic job of establishing and remaining consistent with this. It's, you know, basically, we're told from the very beginning, right after Isildur cuts the fingers off of Sauron, he has a chance to destroy the ring, but, you know, the, it's, it's the desire for power which leads to ruin, which is also something that's very true in real life. It is, I, I suppose I could delve briefly into that before returning to the corrupting influence. The idea, I, I feel, as conveyed in the film, is that one should basically be grateful for what one has and be happy with that, not seek something greater, be it wealth or power. The, it, it's the same thing with the dwarves having dug too deep and they released this Balrog, this ancient fire demon. It's, you know, be, be careful how far you go and take, take heed. I just keep speaking old English tonight. It's, yeah, you know, because of the dwarves' greed, they dug too deep seeking treasure and instead found a monster. It's, you know, there, there is some of a... Yeah, to, to so maybe respect things, leave things the way they are. If you, if you have what you need, you shouldn't go, go further than that. I also feel like maybe it's slightly environmentalist, environmentalist what with the trees being felled and old trees of that, when Saruman is ordering the creation of Great Army. I, I assume it's for building weapons, for crafting you know, bows and arrows and whatnot. And I could also interpret it as just, well, you know, strong old trees, those are going to be very useful in, you know, it's going to make for strong weaponry. But at the same time, it's also this, they're not even waging war yet and already they're destroying things. They are killing parts of nature in order to wage war, in order to gain more power. Evil is greed, or greed is one of the various evils. And when you are, when, when you want destruction, you know, even, even just going, moving towards destruction, you may be destroying something. Now, yes, the, the corrupting influence. So, so yes, Isildur is the first where you find it, and he is killed by orcs. Now that I think about it, I'm not entirely certain if they actually did kill him to get the ring, but I can imagine that that's the idea. He, he was killed because he had something very treasured. And that's also something that's very true to life. When someone is very rich, you would think they would then be less worried because they're financially, you know, they, they don't have to worry about money. But what often happens to someone who's very rich is they get extremely paranoid. They start mistrusting everyone around them 
expecting them to be out for their money, also mistrusting sort of not expecting someone to like them for who they are, but just wanting their money. And it, yeah, it, it makes them a target for robbers. And with this, with, with the paranoia and, and greed dealt with, we move on to the next owner of the ring, Gollum. Not seen that much in this. It almost seems like they didn't want to show him too, too much before they had perfected the technology, which they very much had in the next one, but yeah, Gollum, aka the most interesting character of this entire trilogy, by far. Yeah, the he gains the ring and it gradually turns him into this addict. The, the, there is even the line, he, Gollum loves and hates the ring the way Gollum loves and hates himself. It is this thing of, it, it satisfies something within him, but it also makes him feel bad. It is an addiction, and that is, again, that is a very evil thing. It is, obviously, it's a very negative thing to be addicted to something, not just derive some pleasure from something, but to be addicted to that pleasure, even to the point where it doesn't bother you that it causes you pain, or it doesn't particularly give you pause. And the ring keeps him alive for an unnatural, unnaturally long time. And this is sort of, you know, you, you might be temporarily strengthened by something evil, by, by, by greed and, and, and jealousy. And, and he is, you know, highly jealous. He, he hates losing the ring. He does not take it well at all. And this is the kind of thing that can sort of make you feel like you're, you're doing really well. You feel it's, it, it gets your, I don't know, adrenaline, it, it gets you really psyched. It gets you really focused. And it feels like it's a good thing, but really it's not. It's not a good way to live, and it, it destroys you over time. And that's what we see with Gollum, very physically represented. In fact, in Gollum's case, you could probably compare it to one of the harder drugs that, what with how, yeah, how much it changes his appearance and how, how much it destroys him as an individual. Again, I don't know what to do, whether we call him a human being. As, as a, yeah, as an individual, that's what I'm going with. And over the rest of the film, again, we have, I mean, all that, that was just the opening, opening, what's it called? The, the introduction. And over the rest of the film, we see how it corrupts several. It, even someone, someone like Bil Bilbo, who is clearly not a bad individual, he's, and it doesn't even seem like he's worn it many times, maybe not at all before, I guess I'll find out when I watch The Hobbit, and it just, it, it really destroys him, he, he keeps trying to trick Gandalf into letting him leave with it, and then when he meets up with Frodo, Rivendell, I think, at Rivendell, it, it, it warps his face when he, he tries to get it from Frodo, and at this point he's been separated from the ring for a week or more, and yeah, it, it's very, very corrupting, and that's, and, and Gandalf, both Gandalf and Galadriel want to take it, 
but they're afraid to. They realize that it would turn them into monsters. They would be incredibly powerful, but they would be evil because power corrupts. And this is, excuse me, basically, excuse me, the most powerful thing they have. And so it must be destroyed so that it cannot corrupt anyone. And, and evil also becomes sort of a something that just lasts and exists and must be fought and fought consistently. You can't leave even a little shred of it left or it will come back full force eventually. And this is, of course, also something that's very common to various adventures. I, I hesitate to call this a fairy tale, I don't know. Now, the... And, and that's where I, I feel that... Uh, I should maybe talk briefly about Boromir. He is clearly a good person. And... He doesn't want to do, do evil with the ring. He wants to protect his land. He is terrified that he will eventually lose the Gondor, that, that Gondor will be destroyed by the orcs and, and the forces of Sauron. And he is he's told by Galadriel, you know, telepathically, that he shouldn't despair, he should remain hopeful. And he starts to give in to despair. And that's also something that, also a good theme to delve into. You, you can't give in. When you decide that you have lost, that you will lose, you, you know, you, you've done a lot to lose. It, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's, you know, sometimes it's important to be pragmatic, but at times it is vital to remain hopeful, even in the face of apparent disaster. You have to, you, if the moment you give up, it's, it is lost. And fueled by the despair, and fueled by his good intentions, which I'm sure you know what, you know, what path good intentions paves the road to, yes. Driven by that, he tries to steal the ring from Frodo, and you know he, he redeems himself by fighting off the orcs bravely. And yeah, it, it really is compelling how these good individuals are being corrupted by it, how it, it it has that power, and the fact that Frodo leaves, going back to rescue Samwise, you know, that it, it makes sense, you understand why he decides to go on alone with one other person. Samwise really needs a dictionary, in addition to swimming lessons. Alone with me, yeah, doesn't really work like that. Now, that is also one of the ways that the movie does really well at establishing Frodo as this pure good being, or good hobbit. He, he finds the ring, which Gandalf has clearly been too terrified to touch out of fear that he would slip it on and, yeah, use it. Even, even at first, intentionally for good, it would... Because that's, that's the idea that I should finish that before I move on. The, the problem with something like, for example, an, an atomic bomb is you will be compelled to use it. And when you have it, someone else might try to have something like it, or take it from you. There, there, isn't a, there, there is no equilibrium with something like that out, out there. You know, it's, and, and 
it's more dangerous to have than yeah, it's it's a very dangerous thing. But but yes, the the ring remained there because Gandalf yes left it after Bilbo left after Bilbo dropped it. I don't know what was keeping Frodo for so long that he completely missed Bilbo. Did did he not think that he would just go straight home? I don't know. Anyway, Frodo picks it up. And the audience gasps because we know how dangerous it would be if he puts it on. We've seen what it did in the introduction. We, you know, the, the, these two characters don't know quite how dangerous it is yet, but they, you know, the, Gandalf realizes that even, you know, that these, these various rings of power. Anyway, yeah, they. The various rings, the various magical artifacts, are not to be used lightly. He doesn't even know at that point, I don't think, that it's THE ring of power, the one to control them all. And we, we dread that, that Frodo will put it on. Not, not out of any kind of evil desire, just you know, curiosity or wanting to see if it fits something. He's, he's adventurous, we know that. He, he wants to go out on adventure. He, he hasn't yet, but he wants to, and he doesn't put it on. He picks it up in his hand and then goes over to Gandalf. And, and that really shows that he is this incredibly good individual. There, That's what is Necessary, he, and that's also something that this uh, one of the themes. He is unspoiled by the world. He knows about it basically, but only via proxy, only through Gandalf and Bilbo's stories. He has never experienced the world. Hence, he is still pure enough, pure of heart, just to really, you know, make you queasy to actually undertake this, to, to promise to throw it into Mount Doom. And the... about the, the ring, the, the nine rings that were given to kings of men is one of the times that it is mentioned that men are corruptible and weak. It's actually, I don't think the race of men are ever mentioned in this film without, you know, one of the more evolved races pointing out how weak and corruptible we are and how we can't be trusted with something like that. And Again, the, these nine kings, they wanted power, and they did get it, but it also, you know, it also made them slaves of Lord Sauron. He, because he controls them through the ring, even not wearing it anymore, and yeah, they, they are highly powerful. The, the ring wraiths are highly powerful, but they no longer have a will of their own. And that's, you know, they, they were blinded by their desire for power. So they didn't realize that they treasured their individuality. One thing, how exactly would Frodo have turned into a ring wraith since he isn't wearing a ring? Or are the nine ring wraiths not wearing the rings anymore? Because they talk about how once he's been stabbed by a ring wraith that he will become one of them. I also love how he puts on the ring to hide from these beings that are drawn to the ring. He really isn't the sharpest topic in the Shire. Now, I, I am really impressed with how terrifying the, these Nazgul are made to be. Very, very effective in 
yeah, really terrifying us, you know, when you, you really breathe a sigh of relief when they are, in the, when they just exactly make it to the boat, and he's just like, oh, he, he can't follow me through there, he's got armor, it's, he's, he's not going to be able to follow me. Oh, thank goodness, you know, he, he rides on to get to the nearest bridge, and they know where, the, what was it, Brandywine Bridge, something like that, and he's like, you know, quite a bit away, so they're, they're getting the head stuck there, so. Now, the... I... I don't remember if I realized this the first time I watched it, but that... I don't even remember what it's called, the huge thing that attacks in the mines of Moria. You know, the, the thing with the chain and everything. That's where they got the idea that's where Ubisoft got the idea for that boss in Prince of Persia Warrior Within, isn't it? They, someone rolls between its legs to, to avoid being hit by it, and to kill it, they climb on its back and stab it a bunch of times. No, wait, wait. The guys in this movie only fight that creature once. They don't fight it like five or seven times. Obviously, it can't be the inspiration for it. I am really impressed with Legolas' ability to not only fire incredibly fast, the, you know, the British longbowman could do that, but also fire accurately. That, that is seriously, he's like a really, you know, he's, he's like the fantasy version of a sniper with like a semi-automatic or something. That's really, really cool. And it also makes you wonder why the, you know, the, these orcs, they don't fire anywhere near as well. The, the, you know, when they're leaving Moria right around the time the, the demon thing shows up, it just, there's like, I don't know, at least half a dozen at one time firing at them, and they're not particularly hitting at all. So, yeah, probably were trained by stormtroopers. Now, the, I like how the, the, there are several occurrences in this where it really seems like, I'm pretty sure they even say it by name, Gandalf smokes weed. He's like, he's sitting there smoking with Bilbo, who says, like, oh, it's the finest weed on this, I don't, I don't know why I made him Irish. And then later, he, he meets Saruman, and Saruman is like, ah, you, you smoke too much of that, I, I don't remember if he uses the word weed, but yeah, he says you smoke that too much, it has dulled your mind. So yeah, he ain't talking about tobacco, okay? And considering how slowly he moves from, when, Saruman is closing all the doors, Carrie style. He's like going towards the door, and Saruman closes it, and then he turns towards it, goes it, closes it, goes closes it. You know, he's he's just very slowly going from place to place. He's, so Saruman might be on to something there, and also just takes Gandalf forever to realize that it's it's only once the door closing starts that. He realizes that Saruman is evil. You know, he's, he's sitting there being all sinister, talking about how, you know, we, we should use the ring for, you know, we, we should join him and, you you know, you're, the Hobbit will die. All, all this, you know, nasty stuff. And, yeah, at, at the end of the day, he, I mean, he's not even really saying, Saruman, I'll deal with you later, but right now I have to go save my friend. He's just walking out like, oh, thanks for the warning, buddy. Well, maybe not quite that, but yeah. And just, you know, Saruman wipes the floor with him pretty literally. That's, yeah. That's a nice little, you know, telekinesis off they have. Now. I suppose that might more or less cover it. I did wonder if... 
I guess, what's his name, Aragorn is just supposed to be a really capable fighter because he's, like, he's taken on several ring raids by himself, excuse me, at the same time, it was like, excuse me, five of them at the same time, that's pretty impressive. I mean, sure, he lights several of them on fire, I really like how he tosses the torch right into the face of one of them. But, but yeah, at the end of the day, he's still fighting several of them just by himself. That, it, it does go a little bit towards making them seem less threatening, you know. Maybe it should have just been like one or three, I don't know. I like how the, crap, I, I can't remember all the names, but the, the Liv Tyler character, the daughter of Elrond, not, not Hubbard, not the Scientology guy, although he looks about as suspicious as, I, I don't know why they cast Agent Smith as, as an elven lord, king, something. I don't know, that seems a little... It, that's an, an interesting decision. Anyway, Liv Tyler is riding off with the hurt Frodo, and basically, you know, she can't completely escape from the Nazgul, but she gets past some water, and she uses some magic in order to you know, fight them off, and thus it's, you know, it couldn't have just been Aragorn riding with Frodo, because if he stopped and fought, Frodo wouldn't have gotten to Rivendell safely. He wouldn't have gotten there in time to be healed. I really like how this actually slows down and allows grief both uh, for the characters and for the audience. When Gandalf and Boromir die, it's not just something, especially Gandalf, it's not something that's just shrugged off. They actually spend a little time on it. You know, and, and Aragorn has to be the bad guy and say, if we stay here, the orcs are going to swarm us. We have to get moving. And it really destroys Frodo. He's really disillusioned. He, he didn't think, and you didn't think, you know, anyone who hasn't read the book didn't think that something would happen to Gandalf. He's this powerful guy, other than that one encounter with Saruman. But Saruman is older and apparently more skilled. And I also like that, that, you know, yeah, I don't really have more to add to the deaths of the I already talked about Boromir's sacrifice. The, the the fact that Saruman becomes corrupted, that he is turned to Sauron's side via use of the pa palantial, some, something like that. The I like how they they use this fancy. It's a mirror ball. It's or what's it called? Yeah, you know, the, it's the, the gypsy thing, I will tell your fortune kind of thing, you know. And uh, anyway, he, he looked through it and it's, you know, he knew it was dangerous and he took the risk and it corrupted him. The, he was too, actually I suppose I, we don't know exactly why he looked through it, but it was probably to, you know, to gain as much knowledge as possible about Sauron and he was too, that, that's where it gets a little, I don't know, it, it does kind of say that getting into contact with evil will automatically corrupt you. I don't, I personally, I believe it with this powerful tool of the ring, because if you have something extremely powerful, even if you think you're using it for good, it, there are a lot of chances for it corrupting you. I've already gone over those. But just the fact that you, you know, he saw the Eye of Sauron, Sauron I guess, and it 
corrupted him. I, I don't know. It. I don't completely buy that, but I know that a lot of people, maybe especially back when the book was written, believe in this idea that coming into contact with something evil will, you know, it'll rub off on you. You will become evil. It's one of the one of the places where it's not terribly nuanced and doesn't really look at both sides, which, to be fair, it is surprisingly, both for when it was written and for the fact that it's, no offense, fantasy, it's, it really is very nuanced and really does look at both sides. You know, you have Gandalf saying, well, I don't know if that was in the novel, but anyway, you have Gandalf saying, don't be so rash to judge Gollum. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not that easy, and, and don't be so, don't, don't desire to kill other things. Just, you know, just because you think that something is bad or wrong doesn't mean you should really be, be actively trying to kill other, to, to, yeah, to, to kill something, of course, you never just let an orc, but yeah. Now, the, that was bringing to, but yes, yeah, Saruman being, you know, the, the fact that this old wise man can also be corrupted, that it's not only those who are, you know, those who are young and naive, it's not just Boromir, for example, it's not just someone who doesn't realize how dangerous this evil is. It's even someone as Saruman who, who knew how evil Sauron was, even if it had somewhat been forgotten with, you know, these, what is it, 2,500, 3,000 years? I wasn't entirely clear on that. Since the slaying of Sauron's physical form. And the... Yeah, so, so he, he knew the evil of Sauron and he knew how dangerous the Palantir was and he still took the chance and he was still corrupted. So still, even someone wise can be corrupted. I'd also argue that the film has some sort of traditionalist themes. I've already talked a little about how you shouldn't want more than you have. There's also some about your, I don't know, your, Actually, I suppose I have pretty much said what I wanted to about that. And I'm not saying that... I don't really get the sense that there is any malice in it, that it's some kind of, if you are doing bad in life, if, if, you're, if you're very poor, you should just, you know, live with that. I, I'm saying that the impression I get is that Tolkien and probably also Jackson believe that if you are doing well, you should be happy with that. You shouldn't try to take more than you need. You should, you know, always be respectful. Leave some for others to have and yeah, not, not, yeah, not, not trying to have more than you need. I, yeah, I, I think I've said everything that I wanted to say. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.